You may remember one of my favorite films, Singing in the Rain. This is the epic scene where Gene Kelly is singing and dancing up a storm. What you may have not noticed until this minute is he had an umbrella the whole time. <laughs> but it's not called singing with an umbrella. It's called singing in the rain because the rain is the point. The vulnerability is the point. People love to talk about the lean movement and they hate what the lean movement is about. Lean is just a shorter word for wrong. It's the wrong movement. We'll be wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong until one day we'll be right. Pablo Picasso painted 10,000 paintings and only 40 of them were among the greatest paintings ever painted, which means 9,900 times he was wrong. Leonard Bernstein famously said, I'm not sure what the question is, but the answer is yes. And so if you want great marketing work, what you're going to have to do is be prepared <laughs> to approach the problem differently. And it's here. It's right in front of you. Some people, though, you give them a mile, and they will take an inch. So the last story I'm going to tell you is this. About five years ago, I was really fortunate. I was invited to this retreat. My family was able to come. There were playwrights and actors and authors there. It was in New Mexico. It was on a big mesa. At night, they brought us out on the mesa, gave everyone blankets. It was really cold, 40 degrees out. We're sitting around the campfire. And then our guest speaker shows up. And it's Neil Armstrong. And Neil Armstrong walks out, and he starts telling us his story, his story of the Apollo 11 mission. And as he's talking, a full moon begins to rise. And he stops, and he looks over his shoulder, and he says, I've been there. The thing is, there's footprints on the moon. And when you think about your little problem of data analytics, or when you think about trying to get someone to approve yet another banner ad, I think it's worth remembering that there are footprints on the moon. And that what you have in front of you, that device, connects you in a way that has never a lot, human has ever been connected before. And that what we have the opportunity to do is see the possibility to bring passion to the table, to create a different kind of art, to do it in a way that the people who are counting us are waiting for us to do it. So on their behalf, I'm here to say, please, we need you to lead us. Thank you for your attention today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we have, thank you. That was very kind. We have about 37 minutes. This feeling that you have of not wanting to raise your hand and ask a stupid question because then everyone will hate you and then you'll lose your job and then you'll get a bad reference and you'll get another, never get another job and then you'll be homeless and you'll be dead. I am familiar with that feeling. That is exactly the feeling of salto mortale. That is exactly the feeling you get before you do something generous. So to your left and to your right is someone who has a question similar to yours and doesn't want to ask it. So on their behalf, raise your hand and we'll have a conversation. Yes, sir. I'm really curious about your daily ritual and what you do and, and how you do so. That's just amazing work. Well, consistent. that's very thoughtful, Derek. So Derek wants to know about my daily ritual. Stephen King, as you know, is one of the greatest writers of his generation. And he's very generous. He goes to writers' conferences. And at many of the writers' conferences, uh, one of the first questions is, Stephen King, one of the greatest writers of our generation, what kind of pencil do you use? And it doesn't matter what kind of pencil Stephen King uses. My late friend Isaac Asimov wrote 400 books. The method he used to write 400 books is totally different than the method Stephen King uses to write books. I am sloppy in my patterns and work habits, and they're not helpful. If they were, I would share them with people. That what I'm trying to, to help you see is that what is universal is that feeling. And it's that feeling just before you drop into a black diamond slope. It's that feeling of, uh-oh the one we don't want to bring to work. And we didn't used to have to bring it to work. My dad used to manage a workforce of UAW craftsmen who bent metal to make hospital cribs. And now it's a laser cutter and a couple robots, right? Because if all you're doing is meeting a spec, we're going to find a machine or someone not in this room who's going to meet that spec. So if we're not willing to feel that feeling, and we, can't, we have to bring it to the conference room when we're dealing with our agency. We have to bring it to the hiring room when we're hiring for diversity. It's always the same feeling. That feeling, that's my practice. If I haven't felt that feeling in a long time, I have to find a way to find that feeling. Thank you for kicking us off. What else we got? 
Yes, sir. Uh, I have that feeling right now. Good. Excited. That's why I'm here. Can I bring you to my office? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the books are for, I hope. Can you say huge one time for me? Can I say huge? The word's huge. Why is that? An audio book. When I listen to you, yes. you say it. I say huge? Yeah, I say huge. 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 So, okay. <laughs> Oh, more of a, I guess that's a Buffalo thing. So, you know, the thing about uh, books is if you get 20 people in an office to read the same book at the same time, they will develop a new vocabulary. And they may not be per converted, but that's fine. They understand there's a new way to talk. And if 20 people have a new way to talk, things change. So when I wrote the book Purple Cow, I shipped it in a milk carton, which is not easy to do because you can't hand make a milk carton. They have to be made by a machine. But the machines that make milk cartons are in dairies. And dairies are wet and clean. And books are dry and dirty. So I needed to find a way to get a machine that for six hours would seal up these milk cartons. Turns out Epsom salt used to come in a milk carton. So I found a guy with an Epsom salt factory, got him to shut it down for a day and make my milk cartons with the book inside the, the milk carton. And then we mailed the milk carton with a stamp on it straight in the mail as the envelope. So this milk carton shows up on your desk. And people come into your office. And they say, there's a milk carton on your desk. Now, if it had been a book, no one would have said anything. And they say, there's a milk carton on your desk. And so now a conversation begins. Then 10 people in the office read the book. Someone goes to a meeting. And then another meeting, another meeting. And then I get an email from a guy. And he says, um, I'm working in a matrix organization. I got two bosses. And one of my bosses says, hey, Jacob, do some research. Figure out we need one of those purple cow things. I don't know what a purple cow is, so I just shake my head and say, sure. Then I go to meet with my other boss. And Michelle says, hey, Jacob, we're looking for a purple cow. What can you come up with? So he's writing me this letter to tell me what happened. He says, a week later, I go back to my first boss. And I say, thanks for the tip. I got the book, Purple Cow. It's a really vivid way for us to move forward. And the boss says, there's a book? <laughs> and that's why I wrote it. I wrote it because if there's a word, we can talk about it. If we can talk about it, we can imagine it. If we can imagine it, we got a chance to go forward. So one of the things that we need to do when we go to work is figure out this delineation between responsibility and authority. That we, if we work in an organization with more than 10 people, it's more than a year old, authority is everything. How do I get to be able to tell other people what to do? How can I get people to obey my wishes? It's really difficult to make change happen if you need authority to do it because your boss isn't going to let you. But responsibility isn't given. It's always taken. If we take responsibility, it turns out we can get away with an enormous amount. And if you're constantly giving away credit and taking responsibility, a line will form out the door. People will want you to give them credit. And the next thing you know, you've changed things. Not by doing a top-down reorg, but by doing a little tiny thing. Spend an hour a day on customer service calls and invent a new way to deal with angry customers. Spend a little bit of time in the field and come up with a new way to have your widget work in the field. There are lots of different ways to fail. To fail and fail and fail. Take responsibility every time, innovate, and once it starts working, let your boss take the credit. That's way better than having me come to your office. But I'll say huge anytime you want. Yes, please. <laughs> What do I wish more marketers would ask me about? So marketers are narcissistic, short-term, selfish hype masters who justify it because they say, I'm just doing my job. And at the same time, we don't do enough of our homework. Like If you had an accountant who made stuff up as she was going along, you'd fire her. Or if you had people in the office who stole a laptop every single time they left the office, you'd fire them. But marketers steal assets all the time. They spam their list when the list doesn't want to hear from them. They burn trust, blah, blah, blah. So the, the wrong answer, the easiest way to gather a crowd of marketers is to say, I have a brand new shiny shortcut. If you say that to marketers, they all want to hear what it is. And almost all online marketing literature is about that. And what marketers don't say is, do you know a slow, difficult, painstaking way that I can carve out a new future that one day may or may not work? And yet, those are all the people we say are our heroes. Every one of them. Airbnb, failure. iPhone, failure. Facebook, 
took a few weeks of failure. Then it started to work at Harvard. But the point is that the lightning bolt of Facebook is rare indeed. That what we usually do as marketers is this long slog through the desert. And then we begin to find traction and end up at the next thing. And I think Salt Lake City is a testament to that. That's why the city's even here. And that method is completely different than let's just fly all the way to Laguna Beach and start there. Because we don't know how to get to Laguna Beach, and we don't have a plane. So we got to walk, and we got to figure out what are the least painful ways I can use to get there, but they're going to be painful. And if you ever feel down, go read the reviews on Amazon of To Kill a Mockingbird, Harry Potter, name your book, because there are one-star reviews, lots of them. And if Harper Lee had been working when Amazon was around, I don't think she would have written the book because she needed to be insulated by her editor and by geography. And Amazon doesn't let you do that. So most people are either cowering in fear and doing nothing, or they're writing uh, mediocre stuff for average people. And it's not just books. It's laptops, which haven't gotten as good as they should have gotten in the last five years, because everyone who's in that business is afraid. And go down the list. So if you can show up and pretend you're not afraid, you have such huge advantage over everybody else. You don't have to be unafraid. You just have to pretend. Yes, please. Is that concept of not being afraid of what other people are saying, clearly if you, you have a, a massive profile and you have one-star reviews, how, how do you ignore those or work around? Do you, what, what is your methodology for harnessing the good and avoiding the bad? <laughs> so five years ago, I stopped looking at my reviews on Amazon. I haven't seen a single one in five years. And it, for my mental health, it was one of the smartest things I ever did. I don't have comments on my blog. When I took comments off my blog seven years ago, people screamed and yelled at me. It's not a real blog anymore. Well, if you want to have a blog with comments, you can have one. I don't want strangers coming to my house and dumping trash in my front yard. That's what they were doing. And I, it would take, first, it would take me a week to get over a really bad one. And secondly, I'd start writing the next blog post, and I'd start putting qualifiers in and making it more clear and not being quite high, as a hyperbolic. And I ended up with crap. And I said, so either I'm going to have a blog with comments and no posts, or I'm going to have a blog with posts and no comments. Those are the only two choices. And there are other people, like Gary Vee, he loves to be in the mix. The more you insult Gary Vee, the better he's doing. But that's because he's from Russia, and I'm not. And <laughs> that's OK. You're going to have to figure out what you need to do the art that you want to do, and how you have to either isolate yourself or not. So I have to do things now and then where I don't put my name on it. Because putting it into the world without my name on it feels different to some people than if it does have my name on it. And I can then see, exposed to the market, how people interact with it. And it doesn't feel as personal. And I can learn from that and say, oh, now I can go do that over here. So again, this is a craft. It's a practice. There isn't a best practice. It's just what's going to get you where you need to go. We can't make the noise in our head go away, but we can dance with it. And it's the dancing with the fear that turns it into, my friend Steve Pressfield calls it resistance. The resistance is the source of writer's block. Resistance is why people don't raise their hand until the end of the talk, and then they all want to ask their secret question at the end, right? Because we don't want to get in trouble. We don't want to be uppity. But that's been built in our culture. It's not protecting us from saber-toothed tigers. It's just we built a culture that forces us to conform because the people in charge want us to conform. Yes, sir. So I thought you brought up Gary Vee. I think he's you know, who we think of today as a self branding yourself. I see you as the godfather of you did that way before it was even possible in today with digital media to you know be kind of brand yourself and become a brand that can get. How did you back in the day hack the system be, to become Seth Godin with your brand? What was there back then? What tools was there back then to like get started? And when, when do you feel you like found that? Your, what was your first viral hit, or what was it that hit? So I, I've been doing projects for a really long time. So the projects, the intent of the projects was not for Seth Godin to become a brand name. The intent of the projects was I like to make stuff. I started an internet company in 1991 before anything, right? And uh, we invented commercial email. So if any of you have ever sent email for your company, it's because we invented that. And we had very little venture money. We were Fred Wilson's first investment. But we only had $4 million to spend. Our competitors had 80 or $100 million to spend. So I couldn't run ads. My sales force was tiny. 
So I shaved my head, and I went on the road and started giving speeches. And the purpose of the speeches was not to get people to hire us. The purpose of the speeches was for me to teach people that there was a way to be in the world, that permission marketing was a thing. That if you could understand that, fine. Go with God. Have fun. And many of the people, once they realized they wanted it, called me. The first 100 speeches I gave, I paid money to give. So the PR firm went out and pushed to this guy. And you know, the first time I spoke at Internet World, I was the 240th ranked speaker. And so I decided, well, here's a metric I can work on. And so the next time I was the 120th ranked speaker, and the next time I was the first ranked speaker, because I worked on it. That was my job. My job was to put, to invent slides with no words on them, to come up with, do 100 slides, don't do seven. That craft enabled me, before there was high-speed internet connections, to be in front of the kind of people who were looking for someone who wanted to say, if you're enrolled in this journey, follow me. But a key part of it was we gave away every secret we had. Nothing was proprietary, and we taught as many people as we could. And when people left our company, they went and built other really cool companies. That was part of the mission, because it's a connection, it's culture, you know, and the idea that we're all going to be better off if we're more connected, that was key. So that, that, I, did, I didn't do it as on purpose, as, as intentionally as it sounds, because you know, I'm making up the arc as I live it. But that's how we tried lots of other things that didn't work, but that was clearly part of it. Yes, sir. Right. And specifically more about permission marketing, drive building, you know, with everything. Because everyone's doing it now. You, you invented it, people are doing it. But now there's just so much. Right. So, the noise. so the next big thing is an interesting challenge. Because you know, if we had all bought Bitcoin at 10 bucks, we wouldn't have to come. <laughs> but I really believe this is the next big thing. That it started 20 years ago. 20 years I've been doing this. And the, none of the principles have changed, not one of them. That feels to me a lot like the way the Industrial Revolution went down. So Henry Ford would be amazed at the Ford Robotics Factory in Dearborn today. But the principles of making a Ford are very similar as they were in 1920. Well, I think that's true here. So is SMS way better than email now? Absolutely. Because you have to pay for SMS, which means it's a clear channel, which means if you spam people, you're in really big trouble, which means that you better have a budget, all those things. So yeah, build SMS before you build email. But it's exactly the same principle. And you know, when we all snow crash up and enter VR world, I will have no idea how any of that's going to work. <laughs> no clue. I don't understand um, how we're going to live in a world where the next 50 million Americans lose their jobs to automation. It will happen, and new things will layer on top of it outside my pay grade. But this thing that's going on right now, I don't see that changing in my lifetime. Because human beings want to be connected, and we all have a limited amount of attention. And when you put those two things together, I only see one way out of that. Thank you. This gentleman, and then we'll go to the back. So uh, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I can implement change in my organization. Uh, I feel like I'm building a ship. I feel like everybody else thinks I'm building a shipwreck. Yep. But I need them to come along with me on some of these changes. Right. So Sure. This is a great question. So leadership, really different than management. And leadership begins with understanding other people are afraid of things you're not afraid of. Other people tell themselves a story you don't tell yourself. Everyone's got their own troubles. And so you've shown up as the entrepreneur. You've shown up as the person at the front. You've shown up and say, this is making me thrive. But a lot of people who work for you have been persuaded that what they need is a job. And so part of the job of the leader is to build sinecures for people who need a sinecure. That open book management is thrilling, but open book management doesn't work when people are coming at it with different expectations and different um, data sets. So you know, I used to come back from a tough board meeting, and I'd pull the 40 people on my team together, and I'd tell them how much trouble we were in, and why we needed to do this, and why we needed to do that, until I realized that was my problem. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was they needed to hear from me. They had this resource, but it was 10% less than it used to be, and they had these boundaries go. So by making each art project sufficiently small 
for the kind of person that wants that project, they could do a great job at it. You know, if you want to visualize it locally, they just sold all these ski areas back and forth. If you're the lift operator, it really didn't matter to you who owns the place. What you need to know is we've discovered that there's a 15% difference in return rates to the lodge, to the ski area, if people have a nice experience when they get on the lift. So your only job is to make it so that when people get on the lift, they don't fall off and they leave with a smile. Can you do that for me? We don't have to have a conversation about the leverage buyout of the ski area. So that is where it begins. It's being able to say, over there, we're all going over there. But the specifics are different because different people hear differently. And the dream of the entrepreneur is, where do you find three people, five people, 20 people, 100 people who get it at the level you're getting it and want to hear it at that level? Because then you're not as alone. But you're not going to begin there. People just need to see the steps. And your job is to tell them the story that makes them feel like each one of those steps is reliably coming. In the back, we had a question. You know, uh, there are tons of them, and I bring them up to myself all the time. Uh, there was a time the vice president of AOL threatened to have me arrested, and she meant it. Um, it's too long a story to tell, but basically, they were 40% of our business, and we built something for them, and it broke. And then a week later, it broke again. And I was on the phone with her saying, I'll fly down to Vienna, Virginia. I want to look you in the eye and personally apologize. And this was when AOL stock was going up $2 a day. And her entire net worth was based on me not breaking AOL. And she was literally screaming at me on the phone. A year later, AOL still my biggest client. AOL was $3 an hour to use. They paid a commission. And they had chat rooms. And the guy who ran just a few of their chat rooms was making $7 million a year on commissions on the chat rooms. And I invented a technology that would let people play games inside a chat room with words. And we built it for AOL with AOL. And it was going to, you know, at the time our company was probably doing uh, $750,000 a month in revenue. And based on all the data we had from all the testing we did, we were going to be making $6 million a month from the minute we turned it on. 100% gross margin. The day we were going to turn it on, AOL switched from $3 an hour to flat rate pricing. And our royalty went from 70 cents to zero. And so that's a failure of being wrong about the timing. Because if we had been a year earlier, it would have been different. My lesson was different than some people's lesson. My lesson was, all right, got to try again. Not, I'm never doing that again, because it didn't kill me. But the failures, I think, that stand out the most are personal failures of not seeing possibility. Possibility in what other people can bring to the table. Possibility in what's possible in creating change in a given setting. And that shift of realizing that every interaction is a project if you want it to be. That what we do for a living is make change happen. And that change can be as simple as brightening up the day of the receptionist or as big as building the Facebook killer. They're all on the same spectrum. And when we can look at it that way, we end up in this post-industrial world, where our job isn't to make an efficient widget that we can make cheaper and cheaper. Our job is to make change that people want to experience. And so every time I feel like I'm too far out on a limb, I realize it hasn't killed me yet. And I want to find that feeling again. But I don't want to do it with a home run. I want to do it with a series of singles so I can strike out a lot, because that's more fun than having to get every single one to work perfectly. We got time for a couple more. I'm asking for this one. You're asking for this guy. OK. He laughed at my Eisenberg joke, so he gets a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what medium is most interesting right now to reach audiences, not maybe particularly for you? Reach audiences who don't know you or audiences who do? Right. OK, so this is. It used to be speeches. You used to go around and do this. Book. Yeah, so this is super important. I honestly do not believe 
that most projects should be based on using a medium to reach people who don't know who you are. And that's true for the first time in 100 years. That the chance is that you can use direct marketing, which is what all the internet is, to build a funnel that pays for itself to reach the right people with a transformative product that you are proud of, really love. You can race to the bottom and play to our worst angels of our nature and be more prurient or angry and get plenty of attention. But that's not work you're proud of. If you want to do work you're proud of, you can't talk to strangers. You got to talk to your true fans. And then your true fans talk to other people. So I don't have to spend money promoting my books or my blog because my fans are talking about it. I make things for them. I don't try to find readers for my writing. I try to do writing for my readers. And the same thing is true for Harley Davidson. And the same thing is true going forward for you know, giant companies like Apple or even Airbnb. If Airbnb can delight the people they already got, they never have to worry about using media to get new people. How do I find the fans? Well, my blog started with six readers. And there were two or three years where it had fewer than 100 readers. I wrote a blog post called First 10. You find 10 people. If you can amaze them and overwhelm them, they will bring in others. And if you can't, do better work. The shortcut of, here's some money, let me interrupt some strangers, used to work great, because you could interrupt them for a minute at a time or an hour at a time. Get standing up on stage, I'm taller than you. You came to hear me. That's really powerful, right? But TED plus 40 other things made that harder to break into now. So what we've got to do instead is not look for that shortcut because it's the long way. The shortcut is actually saying, if I could never talk to another new person, then what would I build? Do that. We had a question in the back from a young woman somewhere. No? Not, then we'll do the two of you, which is fine. You're not like. It's good. Yep. Exactly. So goals, strategies, tactics. You shouldn't change your goal very often. Your tribe should hear that the goal is the goal because that's what they're enrolled in. If you change your goal a lot, if Burger King suddenly owned, opened a chain of health food stores, that would be weird. It wouldn't work. Strategy are the high-level methods you're using to achieve your goal, but they're not tactic dependent. Tactics are things that could break, and you could throw in a new tactic tomorrow, and you'd be fine. So I think we ought to be rampant in how we mess with tactics. You know, so if you think about the hotel industry, they never change their tactics. That when you show up at a hotel, it's almost exactly the same experience no matter what hotel you go to. That doesn't make a lot of sense, because it would be cheap to discover new ways to check people into a hotel. What would happen if the people behind the desk met you when you're walking into the building and walked alongside of you with an iPad? What would happen if you got rid of that whole I mean, tons of tactics doesn't change strategy, doesn't change the goal. So if you have a brand, the innovation occurs not at the goal level, but probably at the strategy level. So Jeff Koons, the uh, artist of some great repute, has gone nearly bankrupt twice and completely hit the wall four times reinventing how he makes his art. But he has not changed who his audience is. He has not changed the emotion he's tried to create in his audience. He's merely changed the medium he's using to do that. And because he has momentum and guts, he puts all his resources in the next thing. So you've seen that giant balloon animal that's made out of aluminum. It cost him $50 million to figure out how to make that. Most artists don't have $50 million to go figure out how to do it. And if he had been wrong and hadn't caught on, you never would have heard of Jeff Koons again. It's that act of fulfilling the goal by changing tactics and strategy. That's where art wins. Yes, sir. And then we got time for just a couple more. Yeah, please. What, what brand organizations people exemplify the ethos of this campaign? Well, so every time I answer that question, that brand is then involved in a scandal, makes a bad management choice, <laughs> and flares and, and completely hits the wall, which is why I don't buy stock in companies, because I'm just like the kiss of death. Uh, I also think that CEO wisdom is really overrated. 
that what we tend to do is see something that happens and then give credit to the CEO, as opposed to realizing that what happened probably wasn't invented by him or her, and probably was just us seeing a shiny object and ignoring all the other hard choices. You know, with that said, the day Howard Schultz shut down every Starbucks in America and put all his uh, staff and baristas through a day of training, anyone who's ever been through training knows that training for one day doesn't change very much. But the signal was profound. For the CEO to say, our stuff's not good enough, our interactions with our customers aren't good enough, and I'm shutting this place down to fix it, sent a message to people who were looking for a stable, good place to work to say, if I don't listen, this might not be a stable, good place to work anymore. Now, is Starbucks perfect every day? Of course not. But there's a moment where a big company takes a deep breath and says, let's get back to the promise that we made. Or if you think about uh, the audacious thing that Tony Shea did with customer service eight years ago. Right? Who else can build a billion dollar shoe store? A billion, it's just shoes. The secret was everyone else said customer service is an expense. He said customer service is a tool, it's a weapon. He compensated his people by how long they stayed on the phone. The record, seven hours, 45 minutes, one phone call, right? Now, I can tell you Zappos stories all day long. The point is it's not a gimmick if it's at the heart of what you're trying to teach people. The shoes are the shoes. The difference is if you call us, someone's going to talk to you for as long as you want. That's fascinating. And it's these choices we make that send a signal that say what we stand for. And that's what I look for. And it's not the company, it's the act. Thank you for that. What else we got? Oh, right there. Sorry, sir. Hi. Face-to-face sales, -face sales calls. You know, I, I was with Tom Peters last week. And he's one of my heroes, a really early mentor of mine. And he was the guy who first told me the story that was a punchline is, sometimes you got to get on a plane. Sometimes you got to get on a plane and show up in somebody's office. And I don't think it's because it makes for a better sales call. I think it's because it makes us more human. It says, this is the only thing that actually costs me, not my company, it costs me, I'm giving up a day away from my home to come be in your space. And too often, salespeople who have been on the road too long forget that that's why they came, to have a meeting. And instead, they're in selfish mode. But if it's not a gift, don't go. But when we show up and say, I'm here in this room with you, when I could have been on Zoom, when I could have been on Skype, when I could have been on the phone, when I could have been on email, if we act that way, then something changes. The problem is that marketers and companies have so abused salespeople by sending them into the field with average products for average people and said, sell your charisma. Well, that doesn't work anymore because everybody knows everything. Every customer is smarter than every salesperson. Just a little Googling makes that easy to do. And so, what, you think I'm an idiot? Why should I buy this insurance from you? You're, you're disrespecting me because I can see right here. It's the same as this, and this one's half the price. I don't need you to come entertain me to do this. Don't make me feel stupid. So part of what it means to be in sales and to be in marketing is to use that same energy to persuade the head of engineering to make something great instead. And when we do that, you know, I, I did a riff a little while ago. If in 1982, the UAW in Detroit had gone on strike and said, we're not going to make lousy cars anymore. Don't send us lousy cars to make. They would have saved 100,000 people's jobs. But instead, they did what they were told. And one day, Ford laid off 10,000 people because no one wanted to buy a lousy car. Well, the people who make it need to speak up because if they don't, they're going to get fired anyway. And that's what I'm talking about when we bring it from the ground up and say, I hear the customer. I know what the customer wants. We're not giving it to them. Don't send me back out in the field with that because I'm not going to take it. I'm their voice here, and I'm going to bring something else to them. All right, let's do one more, and then I've got to take a plane. Can I bring you to my office? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to make the trip. <laughs> yes, all the way in the back, standing up. OK, outside perspective, validation, focus groups. 
I wrote a post two days ago about the difference between will you and would you. That when we go to somebody and say, if I built this, would you use it? Most people will say yes. If we go to somebody and say, I made this, will you buy it today? Now you get the truth. That the way we need to interact with the world is not to seek reassurance, because reassurance is futile. There's no amount of reassurance that will make people feel like it's definitely going to work. That instead, we got to separate ourselves from that, say, you know what? Probably not going to work, but it's not going to kill me. And then we got to go sell something. And it's OK if you make a prototype and pretend it's not, as long as you don't keep the money. But you just go to somebody and say, here, I made this, and see if they'll buy it from you. See if they'll buy it from you for any amount of money. And now you're going to hear the truth. You're going to understand where their fear is. You're going to see the objections. You're going to understand what you're going to need next to make this something that they can leap into. But please, don't ask the amateurs in your life to have the discipline to give you professional feedback, because they will mean well, but they will ruin your life. So with that said, I want to thank you for your attention today. Go make a ruckus. I really appreciate it. Thank you.